It's good to see all of you. Praise the Lord. Today will be our last lesson on the, the Battle of Armageddon. Today we're going to talk about how it will end. We talked about last week where it's going to be fought. And the week before that we said what is it and what is it not. And so today we're going to bring that to an end and how the battle itself comes to an end. And we have discovered in the several lessons we've had on it that uh, the Battle of Armageddon is not just one small battle. It covers most of the, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And uh, this battle will be over at the same time the tribulation is over. The geographical expanse that we talked about last week really says it covers the entire nation of Israel, at least the majority of it, all the way from Megiddo in the north to Basra, that we know today as Petra in the south. Some, the Bible says in, uh, I think it's in uh, chapter, Revelation chapter 16, verse 20, it says it goes for 1,600 furlong, which is about 200 miles, and right in the center of it is the city of Jerusalem. Into this area of the world will come millions of fighting men, millions of nations, armies, not millions of armies, but millions of men in, in the armies. And also coming into this area will be a one called Jesus Christ. And he will be the one that wins this battle and brings the tribulation to an end and the battle itself to an end. And for the time being, for a few minutes, I'd like to talk about that God is in control. He knows what's happening. He's already told us. That's the reason we're studying it, what's going to happen. Everything is in his control. Not everybody thinks that. For instance, about three decades ago, I remember a book. And the author, uh, the book's name was When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And this author said it's because God is not omniscient, that God is not omnipotent. He claimed that God is not really it's not really possible for him to take care of everybody's problems that are severe. But I don't think that's what the Bible has to say. The Word of God in Isaiah, Isaiah the 46th chapter and verse 9 and 10. I was looking around for my water and I couldn't find it. Yeah, it was behind me. Isaiah 46 verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He will do what he pleases. That's what that last phrase says. He can do anything that he pleases. And he is one that can do all things. Yes, there are other players on this field in the Battle of Armageddon. And we've read quite a bit, looked at uh, the 16th chapter of Revelation. 
to look at the seven bowls that are poured out in God's, of God's wrath. And that we found that in the sixth bowl, we find the Battle of Armageddon mentioned. The only place where the, the word Armageddon is mentioned. And in that passage from verses 12 through 16, it says there are other players. And some of those players are demons. The spirits of demons, it says that go out and do wonderful things and convince the, tr the kings of the earth to come to the Middle East. So there are players in the demon world that are part of this. The kings themselves think that they are making the decisions for themselves, for their own best interest, and they're coming and they think they are in control of the, their path. But Around all this, Jesus is controlling it. Jesus is the one gathering these nations. The nations have their own agenda. The demons have the, a different agenda. And God has the ultimate and overriding agenda. Isaiah, excuse me, Zechariah. 14 verses 1 and 2. I, I read it last week. I want to read it again. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. God is the one calling these nations to the Middle East. He has a reason. And the reason is found in the next verse I put on the screen. In Joel, the third chapter, in the first two verses, it says, For behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of his, Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, where I will sit in judgment with them. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people. My heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have also divided up my land. So it's he that's call, calling these, and he has a purpose. He's going to enter into judgment with them there. The bottom line, God is in control. Now let's see how this battle ends. Last week, I showed you part of the battle in, Rebel, in Daniel, the 11th chapter, verses 40 through 45, and uh, how one nation from the north comes against the Antichrist, who is at this time in the, the Holy Land, and a nation from the south comes at the same time, and he goes out and defeats them. I'm paraphrasing it here. And... He, when he's conquering the northern part of Africa, he hears, these, he hears an intelligence report coming to him from, of something happening from the east, and the army coming in from the kings of the east. And the very last words, I think, in verse 45, and I highlight it here, is that he will come to his end, but no one will help him. And I mentioned last week that I, we need to go, and this is what I'll do now, to go to Revelation 19 to find out the details that go into this. Because this doesn't say much about how he comes to his end, or that he is no more, or what happens really to him. And Revelation 19 helps us understand what is going on here, behind the, not behind the scenes, but at the same time, we give or give him more information. Now I don't have this on the screen. I'm going to quote it to you. Revelation, the 16th chapter, and verse 11 through verse 21. It says, "Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true." And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, 
And he had a name that no one knew except himself. Got to think about work. He was clothed in a, in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in fine linen, clean and white, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth went a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress, winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. The scene changes. And he says, Now I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heavens, saying, Come gather together for the supper of the great God. I saw the beast and the kings and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and his armies. The beast was captured, along with him the false prophet, who did signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. These two shall be cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed by the sword that proceeds out of the mouth of him who sits on the, on the horse. And the birds came and were filled with their flesh. What we have here is that the Antichrist just doesn't go away, but he is defeated, captured, and he and the false prophet are the only two humans in all of history that will not go through the white, white throne, all the unbelievers in history, that will not go through the white throne judgment. They are cast in the lake of fire immediately. So we have here, you might call it, the, it looks like it might be the greatest heavyweight battle in all of history. John starts by introducing in this passage the Jesus from heaven. He is one of the combatants. Now, he's the He's the uh, current champion because he's never lost a battle. And then John says, uh, lets us know there are going to be some observers at this battle. You know who they are? The birds. They're going to watch this battle. They're waiting for their time. But as I read the book of Revelation, John writes it in such a way that as we read it, we are also observers. And then he gets to verse 20, 19, and he introduces the best that the enemy can offer, the Antichrist and all the kings and their armies. So in one corner we have Jesus, in the other corner we have the Antichrist and all he can bring. As the bell rings and they come, this is the shortest fight ever. With one blow, it's over. Jesus Christ retains his title, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, John, that battle, we don't, as we can, we're following as the army of Christ, we don't even lift a sword 
That's correct. We, we are the armies of heaven. We're coming back with him, also riding on white horses. And there was a scripture I read last week, and I'm trying to think of it's, uh, it was later in uh, Joel, the third chapter, where he is coming back. No, it's not. It's Isaiah. Where he's coming back from Basra towards uh, Jerusalem, and he's having this discussion with the, wa the wa watchman on the wall. And he, the watchman says, who is this coming from Basra who has uh, stained garments? And Jesus comes back, it is I, one greatly able to save. And he says, I alone, which no one came to, to, to help me on this battle. He did it all himself. And so, yes, he doesn't need us. We're going, we're going to be some observers also. Uh, but he doesn't need us to win this battle at all. John, yes? After that uh, finishing the end of the war, so what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Jesus, and this is, we'll get to this in a few months. <laughs> next, uh, our next lesson, two weeks from today, will be on the second coming, which is this brings this battle to an end. Uh, but we'll get to him setting up his kingdom in, in a few weeks, and uh, that's what he's going to do. However, there is another, if you were to continue reading, see, I, I read all the way through the end of chapter 19, but there's one other thing that takes place in the next chapter, first three verses. It says, Now I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that old dragon, that serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and put a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more for it until the thousand years were completed. But after that, he must be released for a short time. So that's another thing he does when he comes. He casts Satan into the bottom, uh, the angel casts him into the bottomless pit. Uh, we'll talk about more of that in lessons the future. Frank. So the bat there's a battle going on in the valley before Jesus returns. Probably, yeah. As we mentioned last week, the kings of the east are coming, and they're not going to, they are not coming to support the Antichrist. We read in, in, in Daniel 11th chapter that they're come, that when, de, when the Antichrist gets his intelligence report that they're coming, he's angry. He's going out to annihilate them, I think the scripture says. And so this, these, some of these kings, the kings of the north, the kings of the south at the same time, are battling against what the Antichrist rule is. They're trying to put it off. But when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, their eyes are turned to one enemy, and they all join together to fight Christ. Before I let you go, I've already mentioned that God is in control. And the devil has no place in our lives, and he has no authority in our lives. I want to read to you my declaration, and it's not, this is not, I did not create what I'm about to say, but I've claimed it for my own. You may have heard this in the, in the past, but let me read it if I can. This is the church declaration to Satan. Satan, listen up. Listen now. Listen long. Listen well. We are the church of the living God. We are brought, bought with blood, charged with power, married to Jesus, 
dwelt in by his spirit, immune from destruction and destined for victory. We won't fear your foolish foibles or run because of your roarings. We won't fold under because of your fire or be vulnerable because of your vehemence nor be scattered because of your schemes. We are part of the company of the committed, the crowd of the covenant, the congregation of the courageous and the crew of the commissioned. We are a fellowship of the faith, the battalions of believers, a regime of the redeemed and a division of the devoted, the army of the approved, the team of the triumph, and the lot of the Lord's. Satan, the clock is running, and you're out. Excuse me. Satan, the clock is running out for you. We await our rapture, but your rupture. We, our consummation, but your condemnation. Our reign, but your ruin. Our victory and your vindication. Vind vindication. Our success and your sorrow. You can summon <clears throat> all your host, but you will lose the battle. For he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We're the church of the living God, blood washed, spirit filled, Battle hardened, unrelenting, and indestructible, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Amen. We need to live that every single day. We are the redeemed of our Redeemer. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so gracious to us, so merciful. Thank you, Lord, for giving us new life in you. Take us now in our own daily lives and help us to walk where you want us to walk. Help us to say what you want us to say. Go with us to be your representative to the fallen world around us and encouragement to one another within the body. We love you, Lord. We love you, truly love you. Now, bless these people. In your name we pray and for your glory. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We do love you very much.